in August of 1971, Elizabeth and I packed up all our earthly possessions, loaded them onto a rented U-Haul truck, and headed for Alexandria, Virginia, on the outskirts of Washington, D.C., and Virginia Theological Seminary. We were 25 years old. We had been married for six years, almost. Wes would turn four the next October, and David was about four months past his second birthday. Paul was not a thought yet. He would not be born for more than three more years. David was only two, a little over two, but he was old enough that when we pulled onto the campus of Virginia Seminary, he said, Daddy, is this where you're going to learn to be a cemetery? <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. <laughs> Looking back on it, I think we thought of ourselves as being sophisticated, wise to the ways of the world, <laughs> but we were anything but. We had grown up and spent the first six years of married life in Marietta, Georgia, a suburb of Atlanta to be sure, but in those days it was a lot further from Atlanta than it is today, at least in many ways it was. We didn't go to Atlanta very much. There just wasn't a lot of reasons to go to Atlanta. I saw Ben-Hur and Cleopatra at the Fox Theater. I think they were both at the Fox, although I may have that, that wrong. The Fox Theater, now a preserved historical monument, <laughs> not a movie theater at all. There was an occasional shopping trip to downtown Riches, which is also no longer there, especially around Christmas. But those times were rare. We could and we did go months without going into the city. When we were in high school, we both became active in diocesan youth activities in the Episcopal Church and our world widened. We had friends from other churches in and around Atlanta, in and around the city. Elizabeth even had a boyfriend who lived in Atlanta before she saw the light, came to her senses. <laughs> and I soon learned that Marietta was considered by most of those friends to be the boonies. Even though they were nice about it, they still considered us backward and not aware of the latest fashions, the latest fads. And people would often refer to it as Mayretta. <laughs> they would say that we were from Mayretta. I don't remember ever hearing a single person who actually lived in Marietta refer to it as Mayretta. I occasionally hear it today, by the way, and it always irritates me even now. <laughs> It's sort of like a northerner trying to mimic a southerner by saying y'all and using it incorrectly. Have you ever noticed how northerners think we say y'all when we're referring to a single person? I mean, we know better. We're not stupid. But the part about being the boonies was really the truth. We really were in the outlying areas in 19. 60. Teenage dress styles, fads, you might want to say, came to us a couple of years after they hit the big city. That's the truth. A couple of years. When I first started hanging around with friends from Atlanta, I had never heard of Weegens, and I didn't know what Madras was. Now, if you're not my age, you may not know what Weegens mean. <laughs> But if you are my age, you most surely do. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Following my graduation from high school, I was 18 years old. 
my best friend and I drove to New York City where we spent 10 days seeing the city and going to the World's Fair and generally just having a really grand time for one of the reasons was that drinking age in New York was 18 in 1964. <laughs> My best friend was Ralph McGill, Jr., son of Ralph McGill, the publisher, editor, and then later publisher of the Atlanta Constitution. Ralph's mother had died, and the two of them lived alone. They were personal friends of the Kennedys. Carl Sandburg would drop by and spend the night with them on occasions. Ralph would go home from school and find Carl Sandburg sitting in his kitchen playing the guitar and talking with the maid. They were indeed sophisticated. And the first time Ralph and I ate dinner in a New York City restaurant, he was horrified that I didn't know to break my bread before I buttered it and ate it. And I didn't see any reason why you should do that. You were going to chew it up anyway. <laughs> but he taught me. He taught me a lot, actually, and I needed a lot of teaching. I grew up in a blue-collar family. My father was a union member, skilled labor, a person who punched a time clock for his entire life. He was bright, but he wasn't educated. My mother was extremely bright. My mother skipped two years in elementary school. She graduated from high school when she was 15 years old. She loved literature all her life. She read constantly, but she was self-taught. World War II got in the way. Not so many people went to college in those days. My mother's father was a rural hostel man, a mail deliverer. My father grew up on a farm, a father who traded in cotton futures, both in a small rural town in South Carolina. But my mother read Faulkner, she read James Joyce, she read Albert Camus, but she called him Albert Camus because she just didn't know any better. She drank it but she wasn't educated. And my house was a place of lively conversation, a lot of political conversation, intellectual interest. We were open-minded, we were progressive, we were interested in the times and in the topics of the times, but we weren't sophisticated. Music wasn't an everyday part of our lives. What music there was was largely AM radio with teenage pop music, or my father playing the guitar and singing country music. He particularly liked Hank Williams. I don't remember ever going to a museum before my adult life, ever. Ralph and I certainly did not haunt the museums when we went to New York when I was 18 years old. I have never had a course in art appreciation. I have never had a course in music appreciation in high school or in college. And when we were close to 40 years old, Elizabeth went back to school and got her BFA in interior design. And she took a lot of art. She took a lot of art-related classes. And some of what she was learning rubbed off on me. And it was like a whole new world opening up. But I am still pretty much a novice. I am still pretty ignorant. I have very limited exposure, very limited knowledge, very limited education. When we packed up and moved to Virginia Seminary, there was only one apartment building in all of Marietta, Georgia. We had lived there for our first year of married life. There were maybe 20 units in it, all exactly the same. That was it. If you wanted to live in an apartment in Marietta, that's where you lived. I rented an apartment in Alexandria, Virginia, sight unseen. I was there for an admissions interview, and while I was there, I drove by, I went by, I was in a cab, and I had the cab on my way to the airport. I had the cab drop me, take me to the, to the rental office at Fairlington, and I ran in the rental office and filled out the application and put the deposit down, 
and ran back and got in the cab. They asked me if I wanted to see apartments, if I wanted them to show me an apartment. I said, no, they could just pick one out. <laughs> they were all going to be the same. <laughs> Didn't make any difference. It turned out that 10,000 people lived in Fairfax apartment complex. It spread across the interstate highway. It had its own elementary school and its own fire department. <laughs> and it had some real nasty apartments. And the apartment where we wound up was the nastiest of them all. It was 100 yards from the closest place where you could park a car. We moved ourselves and we hauled every stick of furniture 100 yards from that U-Haul truck. It sat directly across a sidewalk from another apartment building, from another unit. There were units everywhere. And this particular unit had a basement where the laundromat was where soapy, dirty water would pour out of the door of that basement across the sidewalk, and we would kind of have to paddle through it in and out of the apartment. We stayed there for a year until our lease expired, and we could move and get a, a, a different apartment. Lesson learned. I had them show me an apartment the next time before I rented it. Now, I went and from that kind of background, the reason I tell you all of that is so that the rest of this will make a little bit more sense, perhaps. Virginia Seminary in 1971 had a kind of sophistication that was unique in some ways. It was steeped in Virginia tradition, and it was shaped by its location in suburban Washington. It was genteel. And, but it was a gentility that was informed by the political center of the world. And it understood itself to be both the theological and political center of the world. Later on, many years later, I would interview for a position in Potomac, Maryland, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C. Actually, I got the job. I went, I lived there for a bit. I was the associate rector there and then the priest in charge. But a friend of mine told me that when they were, who was a reference, when they were checking references on me uh, before they offered me the job, the question that was asked, they said they wondered if I would have the intellectual heft for the job. Part of that's because I have a public school education, but more than that, it's because it's Washington. It is the intellectual center of the world. I actually had a woman, this is a true story, a true story. And when I was in Potomac, Maryland, I was at a cocktail party one night, working, at a cocktail party. <laughs> Listen, that's a lot of where we work. I was at a cocktail party and I was going to Atlanta for some reason the next day, and this came up in the conversation. And this woman I was talking with asked me, in all sincerity, in all honesty, she looked at me and she said, can you get a jet? to Atlanta. <laughs> I said, oh yes, we have jets. I said, we have sidewalks and we have street lights. You'd be amazed. The transportation center of, the, of this country, the airport at that time, in 1971, more flights per day in and out of Hartsville International Airport than anywhere else in the world, or in this country anyway. Can you get a jet? To Atlanta. It's Washington. <laughs> At Virginia Seminary, it is a kind, it was, say was, it was a kind of assumed elitism that comes from a culture of aristocratic family names. That's Virginia. Aristocratic family names, even if you aren't a member of one of those families, it's still the culture. It is deeply Southern but it is aristocratic Southern. By the time I went to seminary, desegregation had happened. The civil rights bill had passed. Racism was not over by any stretch of the imagination, but it was certainly considered as a mark of ignorance and bigotry. By the church, it was identified as a sin and publicly called as such. But the southern aristocratic culture was but a few years, not more than a generation removed from a kind of sophisticated racism 
perhaps all the more insidious because of its sophistication. There was a kind of elegance to it. There were no black members of the faculty or the administration at Virginia Seminary. I believe there were two black students, other than foreign students, two black students out of about 150. <laughs> there maybe were six women students on campus. It was a white male world. It was too gentrified to be discriminatory, and it was too far too entrenched in its history to be open. It was sort of stuck in between. In my first few months there, I ran into what was called the Virginia Tradition. And that all capital letters. And it's spoken with a sense of reverence when you say it. It's the Virginia Tradition. Called that. It was identified as such. No one could describe it. No one could tell you what it was. No one could define it. There was no reference book where one could learn it. The rules were not written. It just came up on occasion, usually in the negative. We don't do that here. It's not in the Virginia tradition. It might be liturgical. We don't have processions here. It's not in the Virginia tradition. We don't do ashes on Ash Wednesday. It's not in the Virginia tradition. And it might be social. We have sherry receptions here. It is the Virginia tradition. We have a lot of sherry receptions here. It is the Virginia tradition. It had to do with faculty-student relationships. It affected the way that relationship worked. It had to do with the way students lived together, the way students studied together. One of my favorite things, and this is the truth, if you ask, this is what you would be told. Daily chapel was not required, it was expected. That's the Virginia tradition. If you wondered what the difference between required and expected was, just go along a while and you'll find out. Because you can't really describe it. Now, I wasn't the only one in my class who had a hard time with that. In my naivete, my lack of sophistication, I wasn't accustomed to such a formal network of rules, even if they were <coughs> informal and unwritten, supposedly informal. But most of my classmates who were not from Virginia struggled with it as well. Some were more frustrated by it than I was. I remember a class meeting that erupted in anger. We had fa faculty there. It was a meeting of our whole class. And I remember one of my fellow students just with this red face and this energy, and it was just so frustrated. He says, the whole point of being here is to learn the Virginia tradition, like some sort of initiation so that we can get our Mickey Mouse ears and go on to our middle year, the next year in seminary. The Virginia tradition. One day I was studying in the library where I had a study carol. And I took a break, and often when I would take a break from studying, I would just get up and walk around the library. I would go up and down the shelves and browse, just read titles on books and do things like that. And do that for 10 or 15 minutes, and it really clear your head, and then you can go back and study some more. <coughs> On this particular day, my attention was caught by a large book called A Pictorial History of Virginia Seminary. I remember to this day that it was written by W.A.R. Goodwin. Well, those were initials, W. Period A, period R, period Goodwin. I have no idea who W.A.R. Goodwin was, but the name struck me as War Goodwin, and I thought it was kind of a strange name. I pulled it out of the shelf, and I started to leaf through it a bit, and then I took it to my carol, my study carol, and I started to look at it more carefully, and I was stunned, and I was captivated. I spent maybe three hours with that book. 
And for the first time, I understood what the Virginia tradition was. I couldn't have told you what it was. I couldn't have described it. I couldn't have defined it, but I knew it. It all fell into place. I understood it. I saw where it came from. I saw it rise up from the founding of a seminary in Plantation, Virginia, by plantation holders, meant to be a low church evangelical alternative to the general seminary in New York City, which was the only seminary of the church at the time. I saw it through the Civil War. I saw its deep, deep connection to the culture of Virginia itself and the parade of Virginia aristocracy that had come past through its doors. I understood it. It was all in the story. It was there. It was all in the pictures and in the stories. The identity of Virginia Seminary, its culture, what it believed to be central in the formation of Episcopal clergy, continued to be influenced, if not determined, by the events of its history, the stories of its past, even when those stories weren't known. It was its DNA pictured for me in this book. And I never worried about it again. I still didn't like everything about the Virginia tradition, but I understood it. I didn't have to fight it. And I realized even that there was a lot of good stuff about it. We had a long history, a long tradition of commitment to world mission and to the spread of the Christian gospel to foreign shores. We were a school where African Anglican churches sometimes sent their best and brightest to be trained and prepared. Many of them trained and prepared to become bishops in those places. We were low church. We were a low church seminary. We were founded to be low church. And I realized that there was nothing wrong with that. It wasn't my particular preference, but it was a good thing. My liturgics professor was very low church. He rarely wore a clerical collar. Liturgy was about much more than candles and processions and vestments. And though you might come from a different tradition and you might go to a different tradition when you graduated, it was a tradition of great value. It deserved to be preserved. It deserved not to be fiddled with, without great care and great need. And by my senior year in seminary, I valued the Virginia tradition. It wasn't so much a belief. I never did really get into sherry receptions, by the way. But I was a defender of the tradition. There was a lot of good about it. But not everything was good about it. It continued to look back to the days of landed aristocracy in Virginia, and it created a kind of elitism that was beginning to fall apart. It was beginning to crumble in the Episcopal Church, even in the Episcopal Church. While I was in seminary, or just before I went to seminary, I'm not sure, I'd have to look it up, the Bishop of Virginia retired and a new bishop was elected. The history of the diocese had always been to elect, a, as a bishop, a priest who had been to the right high school, the right university, and the right seminary. The high school, the university, and the seminary. That's what they were all called. Episcopal High School is joins campus, adjoins Virginia Seminary. And the bishop before and before had been a graduate of Episcopal High School, and you know where, the University of Virginia and Virginia Seminary. And for the first time, they broke that tradition and they elected someone from outside, and many people believed they did it just to break the tradition. Someone told me that the thing that made it happen was at the convention, electing convention, one of the priests stood up and said something about one of the candidates who had been and rehearsed his credentials that he had been to the right schools. 
and that was enough reaction against it that they rejected that ingrownness. And of course, it didn't turn out very well. He was not a very strong bishop. He, uh, I think, really was um, asked to retire a bit earlier than he might have uh, because he was not a very strong bishop. Those changes, that kind of change, never comes easily. It doesn't come without cost, without pain. Now, I loved Virginia Seminary, and we loved our three years there. I sometimes say I became a Christian at Virginia Seminary, and there is more truth to that than there is tongue-in-cheek. I discovered the Bible there. Elizabeth and I had wonderful and deep friendships, and it was an almost idyllic time for Wes and David, even though they don't really remember much about it today. But there was a level of exclusion that I always knew was there. I was not of the right blood to really belong, to really be a part of the inner circle. I didn't go to Episcopal High School. I didn't go to the University of Virginia. I was not a member of the Southern aristocracy. I was from Marietta, Georgia. My father was a union member at Lockheed Aircraft Company. Now, they were good to me at Virginia. They opened their arms and they welcomed us. They held me accountable and they taught me well. And they formed me into a pretty good priest. They didn't discriminate against me. They didn't leave me out. Don't misunderstand me. For all of that, I am deeply grateful, but they were still they. And I would never be an insider. We used to say that if you went to Sewanee to go to seminary, Sewanee put a, a tie on you, a tug on you, that you were always drawn back to the mountain. And if you went to Virginia Seminary and you weren't from Virginia, when you left, they kicked you in your bottom on your way out the door. And that's probably a good thing. But they really weren't much interested in my involvement after I left seminary. They didn't really much care what my thoughts were. I wasn't an insider. Never would be. Much of that has changed over the last 40 years. They have been years, these 40 years have been years of enormous change in the world. They have been enormous uh, years of enormous change in the Episcopal Church. And Virginia Seminary has had no choice, choice but to change as well. The Episcopal Church has changed. It is a much smaller church, at least in this country it is. It is a much more eclectic church. It is not so enamored of its own sophistication. A lot of the old jokes about the Episcopal Church just don't ring so true anymore, although most of us who've been around a while remember what they're about. <laughs> There's a special room in hell reserved for Episcopalians who ate their shrimp cocktail with the wrong fork. <laughs> I had a seminary professor who said more than once, the Episcopal Church can tolerate any sin except that of being tacky. <laughs> we were referred to as the Republican Party at prayer. <laughs> and we were called God's frozen people. <laughs> and like I say, those jokes don't ring as true as they once did, but those of you who've been around the church for a while know what they mean. You know what they're talking about. We also used to say, by the way, you know the purpose of the altar rail in the church? It's to separate the liberals from the conservatives. <laughs> because you have the priests on one side and the congregation on the other. And much has changed at Virginia Seminary. It's a different place. It really is. There's a dean there now who is from England. He's not steeped in Southern tradition. He doesn't know much at all about Virginia. There are things being done there that would have been scandalous in my day. 
Ashes are being imposed on people's foreheads on Ash Wednesday. We had a fight about that every year when I was in seminary. There were students, always, always juniors. In seminary, junior is your first year. That's confusing to people. Junior, middler, senior. It was always juniors who were really outraged that we didn't have ashes on Ash Wednesday, for Pete's sake. And it was told to them that it's not in the Virginia tradition. And by the time I was a senior on the worship committee, I was defending the fact that we didn't have ashes on Ash Wednesday because that tradition's important. They have ashes on Ash Wednesday now. You may be aware that last October, or maybe it's a year ago October, time flies when you're having fun, that there was a fire at Virginia Seminary and the chapel burned down. There's a capital campaign underway right now trying to raise $14 million to, to build a, a new chapel. We're doing very well with it too, by the way. And the real irony is that the fire that burned the chapel down was caused by someone dumping an incense burner, <laughs> a thurible, dumping it in a trash can, thinking it was all out, that the coals that burned the incense were extinguished because they looked extinguished and they dumped these in a trash can and somebody threw paper in the trash can and everybody left and the coals were not out and the fire burned the chapel to the ground. Some of my older professors who are now long departed this life are turning in their graves <laughs> at the notion that Virginia Seminary would be burning incense. They would be saying, serves them right. <laughs> Lesson learned. The reasons we don't do that stuff. <laughs> and the Episcopal Church has changed a lot in 40 years. We are still a hierarchical church, though. We still have a kind of formality. We are still liturgical. And even though we have a presiding bishop who is female, there are fewer women bishops than men. I mean, maybe 15 women bishops and 150 men. Their glass ceiling has certainly been broken, but it has not been removed. There are no women bishops in the Church of England. Although that looks like it may be just about to happen. Uh, England doesn't move very fast on things. We certainly believe in racial diversity, but we have a hard time making it happen. You look around you. We have a hard time making it happen. Frankie, Frankie Rodriguez, whom some of you know, was a brand newly ordained, a brand, what we call a brand newly minted deacon when I came here 12 years ago. Frankie was ordained priest here. I was stunned when I realized, when it was pointed out to me, that Frankie was the first Latino clergy person raised up in the Diocese of Texas. We had four or five other Latinos here, but they were all immigrants. The suffragan bishop was Latino, Leo Allard. He was Cuban. He was from the Cuban aristocracy, those who had fled the country during the Castro Revolution. We had no indigenous Spanish-speaking presence in the Episcopal Church. That's just crazy. The population of Houston is about 40% Latino, but we have a small, fledgling Spanish ministry. Traditions don't change quickly. They don't change easily. There is a lot of wealth in tradition. In tradition, there is a lot of wealth in it. There is a lot of treasure. There is also a lot of constriction and restriction. Tradition is a blessing. It is also, if not a curse, at least a challenge. Last fall, the EMC kickoff skit, if you will, focused on the stories of Christ Church Cathedral 
or Christ Church in Houston. We've only been a cathedral since 1949. We have here a rich history. We have a rich tradition. We were founded on this very spot in March, March 17th, I think. 16th, 1839, almost exactly 173 years ago. Two years from now, the cathedral will celebrate its 175th anniversary, and no doubt there's some special name that you call that, but it's going to be very long and very hard to pronounce, like <laughs> sesquicentennial or something like that. There is a tradition here that is dear and important to this cathedral. That in tradition is embodied in the stories of the things that happened and those events continue to shape who we are even when we don't know the story. Even when it's a story that we don't know. Now, you know a lot of the stories. The stories of the fire, the stories of the root screen, the stories of one of my favorite stories is the story of the attempt to sell, to move to the suburbs and to sell the, the, the land, to sell this place. It wasn't a cathedral. The, the, the rumor is, or the legend is, that they turned down an offer of a million dollars. That's not really true, by the way. No one had offered them a million dollars. They were just talking about they might could get a million dollars for it. And the congregation had a vote, a congregational-wide vote. 700 people voted. <coughs> and the congregation said they did not want to sell it. They didn't want to move. And it's quoted that in a vestry meeting it was said, we wouldn't sell it for twice that amount. That's part of our tradition. We have a tradition of commitment to the city of Houston. It's in our DNA. We have a commitment to being an urban downtown parish. As hard as that is, we have a tradition of mission. You can tell stories all day about the missions of the Christ Church Cathedral. We have a tradition of generosity. This place has always been generous. I have never been in an Episcopal church that has the kind of generosity of Christ Church Cathedral. I really haven't. We have, and when I was, just came back from a conference on endowed parishes, and when we t start talking about stewardship, and we talk about the stewardship of the cathedral, people's mouths drop open and they are envious and they want to know how you do that. You do that by having a 175 year tradition of generosity. Even if you don't know the stories. We have a tradition of architecture. We have a tradition of treasuring the place. We tell those stories. And yet that tradition constricts and restrains as well. It's hard to break into it, perhaps. Perhaps it's a kind of elitism of we are the cathedral and it's hard to find a foothold. It's hard to get into. It's hard to change. It's hard to make things be different even when things need to be different. Someone once said, you know, the whole Lenten thing you used to do on um, Good Friday, the seven last words of Jesus, seven last words of Christ, the seven last words of the church, or we've always done it that way before. <laughs> it is both blessing and it is challenge. It is blessing and yet it's hard to break out of that constriction sometimes. Because well, I came here 12 years ago. I said after I had been here a few months that one of the problems we have here is that we don't have signage. That you can drive by here and not know what this is. And there are a lot of people who are surprised to learn that there's a church attached to Treebeard's Restaurant. <laughs> And if you ask them, if they ask you where the cathedral is, if you say, it's, that's at Treebeard's Restaurant, they say, oh, I know where Treebeard's Restaurant is. Is there a church there? You can drive by here and it's not visible. We don't have a sign that says 
That's what we, who we are. We do a 1205 Eucharist, Monday through Friday, and we don't do that for our membership. We don't do that to try to get people to come in to town to go to church on Monday or Tuesday. We do it because we're downtown and we offer that to the downtown community, people who work in offices. If they, some one day they just need to go to church, they need to have a need for prayer, there's a place where they can do that. Isn't it strange that we don't advertise that? <laughs> Isn't it strange that we do that for downtown? And downtown has an idea that we're doing it. Guess what, people? You ought to just guess that there's a... You don't know that there's a cathedral there, but you ought to guess that if you walked across the street, you could find church. And so I started saying this. I started saying, you know, we need, and everybody says, you know, we do need signs. It's been 12 years. <laughs> it's been 12 years. And every time we develop a plan for signs, we immediately start, ooh, that doesn't fit very well with, it's tacky. <laughs> And it is. I'm not going to name any other churches, but I can take you to some churches and show you some new signs that are tacky. <laughs> we don't change easily or quickly without pain. Tradition is both a blessing and a curse. Next week, we're going to talk about the tradition of Christianity, where it comes from, what it is. And we're going to finish up with Hooker by doing that and talk about how we check that tradition with scripture and reason. I think we probably have more problem with tradition fundamentalists in the Episcopal Church than we do with biblical fundamentalists in the Episcopal Church. Okay, thank you.